Everyone having a useful day so far, hopefully? Um, okay, so my name is James Golding. Um, I'm, the, one of the lead, I'm the lead framework programmer at Epic. Um, and framework covers a lot of the pieces of the engine. It covers um, uh, blueprints. It also covers animation, collision, physics, um, input, audio. And it also covers the, the sort of foundation that we use to make the game. Um, I've been on the forums a lot over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks since we sort of released uh, Unreal Engine 4. Um, and looking at what people are trying to do and what problems people were having. And so I, I kind of wanted to talk through today. I'm going to do a quick talk, but I'm going to cover a lot of ground. So it's going to go pretty quick. Uh, I'll make the slides available online afterwards so that some of the details I might skip over now and you can maybe look at those a bit later on. I'm curious, um, we saw the show of hands earlier on, how many people are planning to actually try and make a game versus just making sample stuff? And, okay, so about half the room, that's cool. Okay, so this is really about how to make a game, where to put, uh, what the structure of the engine is, where to put things. So um, hopefully this will be this will be useful for people. Um, also, because I was worried that bringing up a PowerPoint would be would be pretty dry and boring. Um, I've also uh, taken some of the best cat pictures from off the uh, internal mailing lists, and I've put those every sort of five slides or so. So I hope that'll sort of keep things rolling, keep things interesting. There's some pretty good ones in there, and I've even found some relevant ones. So you'll you'll see. Okay, so. What is the gameplay framework? Um, it's basically the set of foundation classes in Unreal Engine 4 that you use to build your game on top of. Um, something about Unreal uh, is that you can use both inheritance and composition. So what that means is uh, you can either make an object by putting components together, or you can make an object by taking an existing class and deriving from it. And that's a pretty powerful thing to do. It's a sort of standard thing to do in, in software engineering. Um, and so we have these base classes that you can say, OK, I'm going to start from that derive from it and then add my own stuff on top, but I still get all the benefit of that base class. So it's a powerful way to build stuff. So we have this basic structure, um, and you derive from those that you need. We've tried in UE4 to keep this really game genre agnostic. So in UE3, it lent a little bit towards making a first-person shooter. It was, it was sort of good for that. But there were certain things in it that meant if you wanted to do something different, you had to sort of work quite hard to do it. We've tried to keep it a sort of level playing field, that it's as easy to make a first-person shooter as it is to make a driving game as it is to make an RTS. Um, and if people are finding difficulties with that, you know, we're, we're always trying to be on, online and on the forums and stuff. We'd love to hear about that and to try and improve this framework and make it more flexible and do more work for you. Um, why even bother having this framework? Why don't we just start from a completely, you know, empty uh, uh, engine? Um, well, we found that over the last sort of, you know, 20 years or so of building games, there have been some patterns that we've used again and again um, and have really helped us uh, make the game and grow the game from something small and prototype to a final shipping product. And we want to try and pass on that information if we can. And we feel like if you spend a little bit of information, up, a little bit of time up front to learn how we structure things, how we recommend you put things together, that you'll find that if you make your game that way to begin with, it'll scale better. You'll have a smoother transition as maybe your team grows a little bit, as the game, you know, you do future releases. It'll just work better with the engine. And so I'm trying to like get that information out there a little bit so people build their games in a way that's sort of harmonious with the, the way the engine works. And we can also solve some tricky problems for you. Uh, things like character movement is kind of a tough thing to do well. There's lots of annoying edge cases. Um, and making it work in NetPlay is pretty hard as well, doing really good client prediction. We've been working on that for, for years now, I mean, since Unreal Tournament, right? Um, and we've improved it again in UE4. We, uh, so we think that's something that we can just, you guys can just take and then use, and then suddenly that problem is solved for you. You can focus more on making something awesome and fun and doing something really new, and some of those basic things are done for you. And boring stuff like dealing with handshaking in multiplayer games and disconnects and routing input to the right things. And there's a ton of problems we can solve if we have a little bit more framework in there than just the sort of basic functionality. So what do we not do in the framework? Um, we don't have any kind of weapon system. Um, we did in UE3, but we found it was really unhelpful because every game has a different idea of a weapon. Many games don't have any weapons. So rather than trying to do that, we'll leave you to, to do it, and we'll just try and have some good tutorials on how you might put that together. Uh, there's no idea of health or death either. Uh, it, that, again, is very kind of game specific, and we felt like we didn't really bring any value there, so we didn't bother doing it. OK. Cat picture number one. We're going to talk about actors. What's an actor? So an actor is an entity in the level, something you can place in the level. You just saw Jim building um, levels by placing actors in there. Um, an actor itself is actually not very interesting. It's basically just a bag that holds components, and that's what does the interesting stuff. Um, the one thing that is important about actors is uh, if you were making a network game, only actor properties or properties of classes that derive from actor can be replicated. So that's kind of an important consideration. You'll sometimes see actor used for things which are not placed in the level um, so that they can get that replication. Um, some things to know, actors themselves don't actually have a location. Um, when you ask an actor where are you, it has this idea of a root component, and it asks that where it is. 
Um, that way, we sort of avoid confusion of trying to attach actors to components and all kinds of mess that happens there. So actors are basically just these groupings of components and, and with behavior. Um, uh, if you're using uh, C++, one thing to note is you need to use the spawn actor function. Um, don't use new object or construct object because bad, bad things will happen. Um, another thing if you're a programmer is if you create an actor, it won't automatically get cleaned up for you. You have to explicitly delete it. Uh, if you change levels, it'll go away, but just during gameplay, it won't go away. Um, unlike things like textures and sounds, which if you're not referencing anywhere, they'll, they'll get cleaned up for you. Actor components. This is my favorite picture, I'm afraid. Um, so like we said, actors are just these kind of empty, uh, this empty class that you can fill with interesting, tasty components. Um, what's an actor component? It's some piece of reusable functionality. Uh, and so it could be an audio component or a static mesh component or a light component. Um, I'm going to jump into the editor quickly because it's actually quite a good way to show this stuff. So if you go to components mode, uh, you can kind of see the structure of this, um, of this blueprint. You can see all the different components. I can drop down this box. Here are all the components that come with the engine. Um, there's some useful stuff for like doing collisions. Um, child actor component lets you put another blueprint inside your blueprint. Um, you can put particle systems and all kinds of stuff. And it's easy to write your own components. We've made it so that you can write new components in a plugin really easily. Um, your game might need to do something cool. I'm sure that as the community grows and starts doing all kinds of things, we'll see this list potentially get, get really big for, if people are you know, sharing that kind of stuff. So it's pretty exciting. Um, in this list, it's just like Jim showed in the level where you can, you can just drag things around to attach them to each other. Um, and so inside your actor, you're basically building a little scene graph. So you might have you know, a character a skeletal mesh, and he might have a hat static mesh, and that might have a light attached to it. So you can build pretty complicated systems all inside one actor and write behavior that, that deals with that whole, that whole system. Um, oh, and uh, components also have most of the interesting events on them. So if I select a static mesh component, um, I can see all the different settings just for that component. Uh, down here, there's also a list of uh, events for that component. So components come out of the box with a bunch of useful uh, behaviors, like when I bump into it, the hit event. When I overlap it, like if I'm looking for a trigger, I get a begin and an end overlap event. Um, I also get events if I'm making a game, say, for mobile, but I want to touch an object in the world, I get events for that. If I'm making a game where I have a mouse cursor, moving my mouse cursor over the object, I get events for that, so I can have it change color when I move my cursor over it or click on it. So there's lots of really useful behaviors out of the box. Um, and if I select any of these, it immediately just drops down the event in the event graph, and I can start scripting for something to have, have it happen in there. And so I can do that for each component. So I can have it, you know, when I click on that component of this blueprint, it does one thing versus a different one. Um, one other thing I'll mention quickly about attachment, because I saw this, a lot, a lot of people on the forums knew this, and it's a pretty useful feature. When you attach things together, you see in here, you have this location and rotation relative to uh, its parent. Um, but what you can do is you can actually, this one's actually already done it. Oh, what is that? OK. Um, if you click on the title, it changes it between absolute and relative. Um, so for example, if you attach two static meshes together, normally when you scale the base one, the child scales with it. It normally inherits scale by default in the engine. But if you click on that box and change it to absolute scale, um, the child will not inherit scale. It'll still inherit the translation and rotation, but not the scale part. Um, this can be useful, for example, if you're building a game like Assassin's Creed, where you want the camera to inherit the translation from the player, but not the rotation, you can turn on absolute rotation, and, and that's how you can do that. So that's one of the useful tools when you're building different genres, different setups. OK. Um, so those, like I said, those are different events on there. Um, when you're working in the Blueprint Editor, uh, some of the components um, will be blue and some of them are white. The difference is the blue ones are added from a native base class, so I inherited some class um, that a programmer put together. Maybe it's us, maybe it's someone on your team. If it's blue, you can't delete it. You can't remove a component that a programmer has added in the base class, but the white ones are the ones that you've added. You can still change the properties of those components that the, that the programmer added. So they could add a, a box component and you could change the dimensions of it, for example, if they let you. They can choose not to. We talked about attachment already. Okay, uh, pawns and controllers. So in this um, illustrative example, uh, the cat uh, is uh, the pawn, and the stormtrooper is our controller. This is kind of an important concept for, for, for Unreal Engine. Um, a pawn is basically your actual physical entity in the world. It's the agent, it's doing the running around, um, it, it's the thing that's interacting with the environment. The controller is just the will, is the mind um, that's not, and we separate those two things out, and there's a few good reasons for doing that. 
sort of pawns can be possessed by controllers. They don't have to be. Um, normally, a pawn handles the input. So when you press a key, it's normally the pawn that knows what to do with that. That way, if you have lots of different pawns in the game, you could imagine a, a game with lots of different types of vehicles you could drive. They'd each have their own handling of the input because it means different things for each one. And you'd want to put things like health inside the pawn, um, those kinds of things. The controller can possess a pawn. Um, controllers could be a human player, a player controller. It could be an AI controller. And that's what's really nice about this split is it means you can make the one pawn and that can either be driven by AI or by a player. It also means in situations like um, a multiplayer game where I'm playing as a pawn, that pawn dies, and I respawn, so now I change my controller to possess this pawn instead, but I can leave that one alone as a corpse on the ground or whatever. And it just makes, it's just a logical way to, to group things. So it's useful when you start building a game to think about what belongs where. Uh, player controller, uh, or cat controller, I suppose. Uh, this represents a human player, so this is the kind of controller you use when you're actually sitting there and, and plugged in, or your cat is sat there and plugged in. Um, there are some useful options in player controllers. One reason you might want to make your own blueprint of player controller is that's where the option is to show the mouse cursor or not. So if you want to make a, an RTS versus a first person shooter, that's where the option is. Um, and there's various options in there for like um, clicking on things in the level and stuff. Uh, and it's a good place to put any kind of behavior, either in a blueprint or in C++, that deals with um, like an in-game menu, for example, something that's not related to the actual bloke running around in the level. Um, voice chat, we have support for that in the player controller as well. So if you think of things that sort of pertain to the player himself rather than his entity in the world, that's the place to put it. Uh, one thing I'll mention just briefly, controllers also have a control rotation. Um, the point of that is that that's sort of where you want to look, but you can choose whether the pawn or the camera or both uses that rotation. So you'll see if you look through the templates that come with the engine, that all the different styles of camera, like whether it's first person or third person or top down, um, are using different combinations of um, use control or rotation pitch on the, on the pawn or on the camera component to get different behaviors. So it's a, we're gonna do, I'm going to do a blog post on this in more detail, but it's just a key thing to think to sort of know. I've seen a lot of confusion on the forums of people trying to get different combinations of like, oh, I want a game like Spiral Knights, or, oh, I want a game like whatever. It tends to be some combination of uh, use controller rotation on the camera and on the pawn, and use absolute rotation or not on the camera as well. So. Character, uh, the now famous cat in tie from, uh, from some of our t-shirts at GDC. Um, so a character is a special kind of pawn that comes with the engine. It's actually easier, I'd say, to, um, to show you this in the engine. Um, let me fire up the third person project quickly. Should have loaded that already. Luckily, it loads quickly. Okay. Um, so this is our template for a third-person game. It basically just has two blueprints in it: uh, a character blueprint and a game mode. We'll talk about game modes in just a minute. Uh, this is all the logic for it, but we were looking at components. So here you see those are those four blue components. These are the ones that come every time you make a character blueprint. Uh, it comes with a character movement component. This is all the settings for how the guy actually runs around, um, how high he can jump, how fast he can move, how quickly he stops. We're trying to make this really flexible so it'll cover a lot of different cases. And it's never going to cover everything. There's so many crazy games that people are making out there, it's not going to do everything. But we're trying to find ways to make it really flexible. In 4.1, there's some changes we've made to allow you to easily implement things like double jump in blueprints or jumping where you hold this button to go higher. We're adding that at the moment. That'll probably be in 4.2. So we're keeping an eye on the forums of things people are trying to do um, and, making, and adding where appropriate options to do it. But already, you can do some quite fun stuff. You can come in here and be like, I want to jump much higher than that. So I change my jump velocity. Oh, that didn't talk very well. There we go. Uh, I can jump into the game. And I was like, yeah, super jump, man. Um, so it's pretty fun to just, oh, go away, uh, to play with that stuff. So that's the character movement. Um, our root component in this case is this capsule. That's what we use for collision with the world. Uh, the arrow component is just to help tell you which way is forwards. In Unreal, positive x is forwards. Um, anytime you see a node like get forward vector, et cetera, Positive X is what you're thinking about. Um, that's not the convention for necessarily all 3D packages and stuff. I think Maya and stuff is minus Y as forwards. So sometimes when people give you a character mesh and you bring it in, uh, it's pointing the wrong way and, and the waltzing sideways. Um, so that's easy enough to fix. You can always just select the mesh and rotate him. Oh, I left the game running. Hold on. There's a bug. Um, you can just come in here and rotate him. Um, but often it's nicer not to have to do that. Um, and so just to like tell your artist, positive X, please, if possible. But it's not a big deal. 
Um, and then uh, in this particular case, we've added two extra components. We've added a camera boom and, uh, and the follow camera as well, so that the camera follows around the guy uh, rather than being attached to him. Um, but so like I said earlier on, the advantage of using our character class is that you get a lot of functionality out of the box, and it handles networking and all that kind of good stuff. HUD. Uh, the HUD class is uh, what you use if you want to get some simple UI on the screen really quickly. Uh, if you want to put a health bar on there, or you want to put like an ammo counter or a crosshair in the middle of the screen, you can make your own blueprint or your own C++ class that derives from HUD. You've got an event in there which um, uh, lets you draw um, text, lets you draw rectangles and materials or textures on the screen. You want to put a mini-map up, for example. Um, there's some simple support in there for boxes you can click on with the mouse, so you can build some simple UI with it, but there's no like, graphical tool for it. Um, it's very kind of like simple, straightforward, um, uh, direct way of making things, but it can be a good way to get some stuff on the screen, particularly when you're prototyping. Um, but we've, we've certainly done, I mean, the UI for uh, the in-game um, stuff for um, like UT3, I think, was all done using Canvas, so you can, you can do some pretty, pretty fancy stuff if you need to. Game mode. So uh, now we've got these different classes. We've got a HUD, we've got a player controller, we've got a pawn. The game mode is basically the thing that ties all those, thing, all those pieces together. Inside the editor, if you come in here, you go to your project settings, you can set the default game mode for your game. So whenever you open a level, this is the game mode that's going to be used. Um, you can either choose an existing game mode, you can make a new blueprint game mode right here, and it shows you below for that game mode um, what settings am I using. You can also just open it in here. So you can see you're choosing which pawn class, which HUD class, which player controller class. There's a couple of other ones as well. Um, so that's the main purpose of using a game mode, is basically to tell it which set of classes to use when I play the game. Um, the other thing that game modes are useful for is if you need particular rules for your game. So if you're making a capture the flag mode, you might have a set of rules about when you can spawn, uh, what the objectives of the game are, when does the round start. Um, you might also want certain things like what the current score is. That's a good place to put it because everything can get to it. Um, there's a function called get game mode, and you can just, you know, every object, every pawn, every actor in the level can, can, can get access to that game mode object. Um, I went through all that. Uh, things to note, though, the game mode only exists on the server if you're making a multiplayer game. So if there's information that the clients need to know, you need to make a game state that exists on all the clients and can be replicated out to them. Um, like I said, you can get to it from anywhere. We're making some changes to game mode in 4.2, uh, but hopefully this will only affect people who've like, shouldn't affect too many people because um, it's, it's sort of mostly internal, but it's to do with the way that the game mode state machine handles games beginning and ending. Um, so if you've been in there monkeying with that code, you might have a, a little bit of a merge to do when that comes out. Uh, input, so, <laughs> I'll just leave that up for a minute. Um, input, you can either bind directly to, uh, let's go in here. So if you go and look at this graph, this is, this is how our, our third person uh, template works. It's a little bit more complicated than you might expect, but that's because we handle um, console input and mouse keyboard input and touch input all. Uh, so that bit over the right hand side is walking forwards and backwards um, relative to the camera. Uh, we've got mouse input to turn, we've got gamepad input to turn, we've got a jump being handled, and then that's touch input down the bottom there. Um, so you can see that um, if I right click on the background and type in input, I can see all the different sort of basic key input stuff I can do. So I can be like, oh, I press the JK, J key, and that spawns the killer robot or whatever. Um, so you can do that, but a nicer way to do it is normally to go into your project settings, go to input, and this is where you set up what we call axes and actions. So these are like named axes or named actions, and you can choose what keys they're bound to. So forward, WS will do it, so will up and down, and so will the, the left uh, joystick. Um, once you've created those, then you can use those inside your blueprint instead, and that's what it's basically doing down here. It's using the, the axes. The nice thing about that is you can change your input mapping later on, um, and you can iterate without having to go and um, uh, mess with the, the blueprint in a hundred different places. Um, and the last thing I'll talk about is collision. Um, I think some people didn't realize how, how many different options there were for, for doing collision tests and queries into the world. This cat certainly didn't realize. So there's three main types of queries you can do. You can do a line trace, also known as a raycast, more commonly. 
Um, you can sweep some geometry through the world, and you can overlap. You can take a shape and say, hey, inside this sphere, tell me all the objects that are there. Um, and this seems like a very kind of programmery thing to do, but as Jim was showing, it can be really powerful and you combine it with um, construction scripts that you can have things that conform to the ground, you can find objects nearby and connect to them, you can, you can do all kinds of stuff. It's a very powerful thing to be able to do, is to build objects that reach out into the world and, and um, adapt to where you put them. That's, that's pretty, pretty compelling. So in Blueprints, it's pretty easy. If you just right-click on the background and type collision, you can see you've got all these different things here, like, oh, I want to sweep a sphere, and I want to get multiple results, or just one result, and so on and so forth. If you're writing C++, it's all in the, the world. You get the world, and then you can do queries on the world to ask it different things. Um, I had some notes on simple and complex collision, but I decided that's probably a little more detail than going into today. If anyone's interested, we can feel free to ask questions later, but uh, I'll have them in the slides in case anyone uh, wants to grab those later on. And that's it. That was a very quick tour through an awful lot of classes and an awful lot of engine. Um, but hopefully it's helpful if you're starting to make a game or you're, you've tried it already and were kind of confused about what all these terms were and how they related to each other. I hope that's been at least somewhat helpful in, uh, in explaining what this framework is and what it's for. Um, so what I was going to do first is we'll do questions on, on this stuff and then, like Jim says, we'll do our Voltron combining forces and uh, see if we can answer anything you can throw at us and in Origin 4. So first of all, anything about framework or making games or any of that kind of stuff? Oh, there's one over there. What's the best way of doing a finite state machine for AI controllers within the framework? Um, so I'm not, for caveat, not a big AI person. Um, I know, I don't know a lot about, so we have this behavior tree system. I don't know if you've, is that something you've looked at yet or? Okay, so it's not f sort of fully released yet. Um, the tool chain is not, we're using it internally, but the tools aren't quite at the point we'd like. The, the workflow's a little bit clunky, so we didn't want to like make a bunch of tutorials and, and uh, docs for it before we really got it to the point that we thought was good. So from what I understand, behavior trees are like the, the hip new thing in AI. Um, but I, like I said, I'm, I don't know a ton about them. Uh, so we've got a nice graphical editor in there where you can like set these things up. Uh, we're using it for Fortnite, um, and we're right now kind of iterating on the tools to try and get them to the point that we want to like, you know, document them and really push them out there. But they do work right now. There's an option. This is the, is it a good idea, Jim? Is it? Um, so if you go to the project settings, no, it's not project settings, it's editor settings. Editor preferences. Uh, under experimental, this should be called experimental, we really mean it. Um, there's an option here to turn on the behavior tree editor. And if you actually look at the shooter game example that we have, uh, the bots in that use the behavior tree stuff. So if you turn that on, then you can open up those behavior trees and have a look at them. There's actually been a few forum threads about behavior trees and blackboards and all kinds of stuff. So like I said, um, uh, buyer beware a little bit. Like we're still iterating on it. It's likely to change a bit. Um, but because we're actually using it, I think the behavior trees you make will probably continue to work. But um, the UI is definitely gonna maybe see a little bit more polish. So but yeah, let us know. We, we have, oh, and navigation as well. We have, do you care about navigation? Um, if I open up the, is it still in my list of, yes. So we're using a library called Recast for our navigation now, uh, which is really fast. It can generate nav meshes. I don't know if anyone used nav meshes in UE3. This is like 100 times faster. Um, so as you can see, this green part is the, is the navigation mesh. I can just drag objects around and uh, it automatically updates, which is pretty cool. Um, this is, this is one of the samples that come with it, where if I click, he'll basically path around objects to get there. Oops. Yeah. And similarly, if I grab this and move it over, maybe this will work. So you can see he's like pathing around like that. Um, in Fortnite, we actually do this, like as you bash down a wall, we rebuild the nav mesh for that region of the world. Um, and all you need to do to use the nav mesh is you drop in a nav mesh bounds volume, and it's kind of cool because you can see if I, you know, right now that's why, it's, that's why it's doing it on the ground and not on the tops of things, but if I move it up here, you can see it goes ahead and builds navigation on all the tops of stuff. So anyway, that's all in there, go, go nuts. Is there a specific thing you need to do to make the nav mesh rebuild during gameplay? There's an option on the nav mesh bounds volume that says whether or not it should rebuild during gameplay. So it defaults to off because it, you know, it still costs a bit. Okay. So I guess we'll open up to, oh no, let's go ahead. 
Hey, uh, I was just wondering um, if you know the answer. How hard would it be to transfer from Unreal Script to C++ in this engine? Um, it's not too bad. We actually had to move a fair bit of Unreal Script to C++ during the transition. Um, and we had a sort of, one of our guys wrote kind of a tool to do it, but it was very sketchy, like it would break a lot, and so we decided not to release it. But, and there's a lot of manual cleanup afterwards. Um, but I would say, like, if you just grab it, I mean, a lot of the functions are called similar things. Um, and uh, I, would, uh, I would say it's not particularly hard. Like, a lot of the concepts are still the same. Um, and you know, just some of the operators might be different. Some of the functions might be a bit, a bit different. But it's not too bad, because the structure tends to be the same. But you know, it's not something we can automate, really, having tried. So yeah. Back there. Um, does the GUI um, frameworks now replace Adobe Flash and the Engine 4? Um, so I'd say it doesn't really replace Flash. The Slate framework right now does not replace Flash. Um, yeah. Slate right now is C++ driven. Um, it's, if you're a programmer, you can put some things together quite quickly with it. I mean, it's a great UI toolkit for building tools. Um, it's, it's, and I've used a bunch of different ones, and, and it's, it's been really good for that. Um, we are using it for, the, for some of the Fortnite UI, but it is very programmer-centric. So it doesn't replace Flash, where Flash is a very kind of designer-centric and also very kind of animation-centric uh, workflow. Okay. What, um, there are some options coming on, like Coherent, just like how to plug in for UE4. That's a like, uh, web-based, like HTML5-based um, okay. plugin for being able to put things in the engine. So that's a really cool, interesting <laughs> option for the short term. Scaleform um, will have a plugin for, for UE4. Um, and what we're working on internally is taking Slate and doing something called UMG, Unreal Motion Graphics, mm -hmm. and taking Slate and basically um, extending it to have a t an editor so that you can either build it in C++ or build it visually. Okay. That's a project that's started now, but it's quite a big project. So we don't really know when that'll be at a point where we can give it to people to play with, but that's our kind of longer term plan for a more designer-driven UI system. So we're working on it. And okay. the nice thing about having all the source up on GitHub is you can, you'll can be able to see literally every, every time we check in and work on it. So yeah, cool, thanks. Okay, so why don't we open up to like all questions about UE4, and me and Jim will do our best to answer them. So, right there. Just wondering about uh, in terms of like animation and characters. So, like how the animation trees have changed since. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no. The last three sessions we got said, what about animation? We should have done animation. Yeah, talk. we should have done. Yeah. I will. I will show you. Thank okay. you. Um, so, are you curious relative to UE3, or just curious generally? Curious gently. Right. Okay. And, and also like relative to E3. <laughs> <laughs> yes to all of the above. <coughs> okay. So, um, anim sets are gone. Animations are individual assets now. So you don't have to try and clear out your anim set of unused animations. Um, Anim trees are replaced by what we call anim blueprints. They're a special kind of blueprint that's designed for blending animations together. Um, the anim tree editor and the anim set viewer tools have combined into one tool we call Persona. And we would like to get FAT in there as well one day. So we have one central tool for doing all kind of character. FAT is our physics setup tool for ragdolls. So we'd like to have all those tools combined into one, one place where you can do all your character related stuff. So if I turn on the anim blueprint filter, um, this is the animation blueprint we use for this game. Um, an anim blueprint has two main pieces. One, the event graph is basically where you can reach out and um, interrogate the pawn that owns you. Uh, it doesn't have to be a pawn. Interrogate whoever word. owns you. What's that? That's a good word, interrogate. I like that. It's like really angrily yeah. ask it for things. Um, so it could be you could ask it for like what's, uh, what's its health. I mean, in this case, it's basically going, hey, let me get my, the pawn that owns me. I'm going to get its movement component. I'm going to see if it's falling. And I'm going to put that into a variable called is in air. And then I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to get the velocity, and I'm going to uh, get the length of the velocity, so that's basically how fast am I going, and I'm going to save that into a variable called speed. So now I've got these two variables, one called is in air, one called speed. The reason that this is separate from the blending stuff is this happens, it's kind of technical, but the blending happens on another thread, and you're not allowed to access this stuff from another thread. So um, that's why it has to be broken into two pieces. Um, but it also kind of logically makes sense that you have one piece that, that figures out all the things you care about, and then another piece that actually does the work. So then the anim graph, this is similar to anyone who's used um, anim trees in UE3, but also tools like Mechanim in, in Unity or um, uh, Morpheme, uh, Natural Motion. It's basically a hierarchy of uh, blend trees and state machines. So this is our top level blend tree. It just has one node in it. It's not, not that interesting. But it has a state machine inside. Um, 
and this is easier shown running. So if I do this, if I play the game, and I'll preview the guy. So now, um, so you can see that when I, I was normally in the idle state, when I jump, it plays the start jump animation. While I'm in the air, it, it hangs out in the jump loop animation, and then it comes back down again at the end. So you basically have these states, and you have these rules about when it should transition between the states. Um, and the rules, if I mouse over them, it says, you know, oh, I, I do this transition when is in air is true. Uh, if I actually double click, each one of those rules is actually a little blueprint. So you can write quite complicated logic in without needing to be a programmer, which is pretty cool. And it leverages all of that stuff we've done for blueprints already. And then each state is its own blend tree or state machine or whatever. So um, it's pretty sophisticated. Um, we also have, inside this idle run, we have a thing called a blend space. A blend space is a 1D or 2D space. Um, in this case, it's just a 1D space, which parameterizes the speed I'm walking in, that other variable that I got. And it blends between a, an idle animation, a walk animation, and a run animation. Let me zoom in on this guy a little bit so you can see. And so I could now adjust like, where these points are to adjust like, where that transition happens or whatever. This gets more interesting when it's a 2D space. So for example, if you're aiming, you might have a vertical and horizontal aiming. And so you could put in multiple different animations for all the different poses or whatever. So it's quite a powerful way um, of blending together animations based on some parameter. Um, so that's a real quick look at animation. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah. OK. I have a question about multiplayer over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hi. Um, hi. Um, in regards to multiplayer and such, uh, how many players would you be able to handle? Because Unreal 3 had some issues once you start getting somewhat high numbers and such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the limitations on UE3 were partly due to the replication system, because it was kind of N squared with, with people. The model is basically the same, but much optimized in UE4. Um, I don't really know, we have, there isn't really a limit there, it's sort of how much CPU you're willing to put on the server, but things like the, um, the way that Unreal Networking works is on the server, for each client, it has a copy of what that client knows, and it, it compares the state on the server with what that client knows and sends any differences every time it sends a packet. Um, doing that diffing is tons faster in UE4 than UE3. So, um, I'm like, as far as I know, on the order of magnitude of like 10 to 20 times faster, like it's substantial. Um, so we can handle a lot more clients. Um, also, we've introduced some neat features like um, dormancy for replication. So something like Fortnite, we have about 10,000 actors in the world that are replicated, but 99% of them are dormant. They're asleep. They're not sending any information. So you can build a world with a lot of replicated interactivity and just wake things up when they interact with them. They can, they can replicate, and then they can go back to sleep again and don't take any cost. So you are limited in the number of replicated objects in your world in UE3, and that, that limitation has basically gone away. Um, we've also got some nice features. We can replicate dynamic arrays. We can uh, multicast RPCs. There's all kinds of groovy stuff. But um, it's, a, it's basically the same bones as UE3, but optimized and, and more featureful. So, and so yeah. Also, from a, just from a design perspective, like everything else, it's, it's, it's horse trading, right? Like mm. the more characters you add, the, the fewer, the less memory you have for other things, or you know, fewer effects, or less complicated animations, or different draw calls. You know, number of actors in the world, the scale of the world. I mean, all these things kind of tend to, to play together. And people always ask us, you know, how many characters can I have? How many polygons mm -hmm. can I draw? All these things are very, very dependent on everything yeah. else in your game. I mean, certainly, it is a <coughs> UE4 is a much more performant engine than UE3. Yeah. I think it's easy to say, oh, it's, it's higher end and stuff. I mean, yes, we're pushing more complicated shaders. There's more going on in our rendering pipeline. So um, uh, it does need a faster graphics card. But in terms of the actual bones of the engine, um, it's, it's optimized. It's not a slower engine than UE3. It's a faster engine than UE3 in many ways. Um, so you should be able to do more complicated worlds. And as we start to thread more of this yeah. stuff, once we move animation onto another thread and we're moving, hopefully we're going to move other parts of the engine onto other threads that'll really start to take advantage of multi-core systems and we'll be able to have worlds with hundreds of characters and like it, it's been designed for that and we want to, we'll be curious to see what people get out and do building games with lots of players in and like find out, you tell us what the, what the limit is. So, okay, any other questions? Come on, there's got to be more. What time is it? <coughs> Cheers. Um, if you've got clients and you want to push data to those, can you still do redirect service? Is the code for that still in there? If you've got clients? 
So if you distribute your game and you want to release maps later, for example, um, can you set up a redirect server so it comes over HTTP as opposed to oh, okay. tied to the, the I network? Don't, I don't know that bit. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, that's, that's, that's deeper than I know. Um, but if you ask on Answer Hub or someone, I'm sure that they would. Cool. Um, I suspect that the infrastructure for that might change. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know that oh, those guys have got all kinds of plans, but I don't know what they are as far as like, building in services for distributing content and stuff. So yeah, I, I couldn't answer that, I'm afraid. Sorry. Mm -hmm. so. I would imagine it's changed since platform has changed. Yeah, that might have changed. So. Um, slight quick one. Uh, gravity, can you change the gravity vector? Can you have Wait, like, okay. local gravity vectors? Wave an arm. Oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bright light right above ah, you. That's my problem. never helps. Yeah. Um, I just wondered about the gravity vector. Can you change it globally and potentially locally for characters? Um, characters, no. Characters still um, only fall down. Um, Sorry. We were, we were trying to build a game that did just that, and he kept saying, no, no, so we're doing find creative ways to do it. But anyway. Yeah, so there was actually an interesting quote on the forums about that. Um, so Zach Middleton is the guy who kind of owns character movement now. And that's one of the things you know I was saying, that we're trying to make it more flexible. We're looking at maybe there's a way to make it work in any direction. Um, mm -hmm. We're worried that it might be hard for us to do in a way that doesn't make it slower slightly. And so that's a difficult decision to make then between, do we add 5% cost to everybody to support the people? I don't know. It's, it's, it's always hard. That's I, just, I remember people trying to do things like wall walking and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would be cool to support. So um, I know there's people trying it, and I know that we're having interesting discussions with those people. Like, there's a big thread on doing like a Sonic style, like loop the loop that Zach's involved in, and, and mm -hmm. that's, that's a pretty interesting conversation. So we're open to doing, making changes that we can to, make, to support that. Um, and if we can find a sort of sensible way to do it that doesn't cost other people, I guess. So I guess that's an ongoing conversation. But right now, you can only, the gravity for characters is only along Z. Um, though, of course, for things like physics, you can apply it whichever way you like, because that's much easier. There's no, yeah. there's no complexity there, but yeah. Um, how does UB4 handle sound and music, for example? Um, so the sound system is uh, a bit different. Sorry, let me just start that by, have you used Unreal Engine 3, or are you asking like just from? Um. From yeah, scratch. We use a little bit of UE3, okay. I have a general idea of how it works. Okay, so the basic idea is you can either import like a, a WAV file. Uh, I don't know if this game has any in it. Um, yeah, if you go to uh, the level one, it has some. The which one? The, the level workflow one has some sounds in there. What, what's that project called? Uh, oh, sorry. Content. Content oh. examples down to. Okay. So um, you can import music in the uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so you can import a WAV file and just play it. That's the kind of most basic thing you'd expect to be able to do. Um, we also have a thing called uh, sound cues, which uh, let me see if we have any in here. Okay, so um, a sound cue is basically a way of grouping together individual sounds in some kind of procedural way. So you can have like random switches in there. So that way you can make like a, a shot, like a, a gun firing sound, which picks like a random one each time or mixes them together or adds some randomness to it. So it doesn't always sound the same. In UE3, you had to make a sound cue. Now you don't have to. You can either play a wave or a sound cue, which is an improvement. Um, uh, it just makes things a bit simpler, not having to always have two assets for every sound. Um, we have taken all of the different, in UE3 we used to have a lot of different sound types that you could place down. There's like ambient sound, ambient sound, non-looping, blah, blah, blah. Now there's just one type with options on it, so that makes things a bit easier. Um, so if you just drag your sound into the level, you get uh, an ambient sound, and then inside here, you have options for pitch and volume. Um, you can promote, and then you can also do, I'm not sure if it's on here, hold on. Um, you can also, uh, change the attenuation per instance, and you can, we actually added different shapes for that. So sphere is the default, but you can actually have like, um, you know, box shaped attenuation. So for example, if you had a corridor that you wanted to have a particular sound down it, you don't have to put like a lot of sounds down, you can just put like a box that fills the whole corridor and it falls off from there. So that's been kind of a nice little feature. Um, so it's been small improvements over UE3, um, but, uh, but pretty helpful ones, I think. Um, there's a great, uh, sound map in here that if you haven't, have you played with the engine much yet? No. Okay. So there's a, there's a fantastic, um, is it in here? I don't think we've released that one yet. I think it may be in 4.1 coming up or yeah. we're going to release that, but there's a, 
Uh, one of our <coughs> um, audio guys did an amazing audio example map, which goes through all the different features and does all kinds of cool stuff. So we'll get that out sometime soon, and it's definitely worth checking out. Um, oh, and we're adding um, audio streaming uh, soon, which is something we didn't have for a long time. Um, which is huge, huge, huge. Right? That means you don't have to like have all your music always loaded, yeah. so that, that'll be good. We're just figuring out how to make it work on all the different devices. And uh, one, one of our, our, the guy who does the audio programming, um, also on his Epic Friday last time added, um, was almost done adding mod file support, like tracker files. Um, because it's actually a pretty good solution for like a mobile game where you want small download size, but you want to have music. You don't necessarily want to have like big music files. So, uh, so that's a curious little feature we might be adding as a plugin um, sometime soon. So get Scream Tracker out again. Anything else? One down here? Like optimizations with uh, the controls, for example, like when you make an input, for, like walking forward with an analog stick with PS4, Xbox One, for example. Oh yeah, that, that would just work. Um, so if you do, if you plug in a controller and like do it all for your controller on PC, um, when you get it running on Xbox One or whatever, it would, it would, it would just work. And engine has an integration now, so it can, for example, make a piece of prototype. It just can move forward and just optimizing stuff with the, the graphics and. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, um, yeah, it's a generic controller. Yeah. Game controller. But yeah, you could, uh, it would, it's absolutely a good idea to start. I mean, most of our um, console games have always started as PC games, and, and then we've sort of then got them on the console and started optimizing specifically once it's on there. But yeah, if, you're, if you want to make a console game, start on PC right now, and it will absolutely transition across. You shouldn't have really any problems at all with that. Um, so yeah, that's definitely Thank a good you. way to start. Oh, one right here. Is um, the workflow for creating stuff like camera systems in Matinee similar to UE3, or has it changed much? Um, oh. I was going to say, the Matinee system itself hasn't exactly changed. Uh, we've had some minor reskinning and, and some minor improvements. However, again, down the line, um, the sequencer, sequencer uh, is a, a new system to replace Matinee that's coming eventually. Um, I don't know if we have a roadmap on when that's going to be released, because it's a very, very big project. Um, but all the functionality that, that was in UE3 is still in there um, in terms of matinee. And there's a couple of really good examples in, a, in a matinee maps of things that we've done and how to do all the camera ships and FOV and all that other stuff. There is um, more flexibility now. It's easier to set up cameras inside your actor because we actually have a camera component now, which is not something we had in UE3. Um, so as you well, saw... You used a little picture in picture, which is cool too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's cool. Um, so basically, you can add a camera component to your actor. Um, and when you, or your pawn rather, when you possess that pawn, it'll use that camera. So you can attach it to a bone if you want to, or whatever. That's that's made it a bit more flexible. In 4.1, we use the activation state of the camera component to choose which one to use. In 4.0, if you had two camera components, it would just pick the first one it found. But now it only picks it if it's active. So it means that you could say have multiple camera components inside your pawn, and then turn them on and off to like switch your camera view. So you might want to do, you know. There's all, we had something ask, if you make a driving game, you might want like three or four different camera components for different positions or something like that. Um, and we just na recently added, so this will be for 4.2, uh, camera animations again. So that's something that oh, you can, yeah, you can yeah. build a camera yeah, animation good. and like just play it, and that's great for, we use that all over the place in like gears. Screen shakes and yeah. kind of crazy stuff. Um, I was going to show you what the... Uh, this is just like, I think it's, it's cool, because whenever you click on a camera, you get a little picture in picture automatically that shows exactly what that camera sees. Because it used to be kind of a more complicated process where you had to attach yourself and then rearrange and everything. And, and now you can very, very clearly just see exactly what the camera sees. Oh, did you see the thing that Joe added where you can actually pin those yeah. now? So, anyway. Cool, thanks. No problem. Oh, it's on that. I'm just wondering how uh, ter terrain creation has mm -hmm. changed as well. Because like we were making terrain for our game that we're doing for our group project for the minute. And it's just that. Is there an easier way of like making sharper terrain and stuff in UE4, or is it the same process as uh, UDK and UE3? Mm -hmm. No, no, there's, there's an entirely new landscape tool now, um, which if I go crazy and try and right here up in your mode and uh, uh, create new. Um, which again, you can set up your quads, you can set up your detail. The, the actual process of going in and painting and all that stuff is very, very similar to what we had in UE3, but this is, is, is much more powerful. You can stitch them together very easily. You can select multiple of them, and the, uh, the, the tool doesn't, doesn't care 
uh, where you are, it'll just paint seamlessly between them. So if you're doing like massive, massive worlds and, and different pieces, you can pull them all and you know, paint pieces in and out and stuff. So the editing process is very similar, but the, the tool itself is a lot more robust. Um, in terms of multiplayer stuff, because uh, you guys mentioned it earlier, for me personally, I've never touched like online multiplayer. How easy would that be to implement? Um, like, how much of it is already supplied? Sure. Um, I mean, network play is a is a is a difficult thing sometimes. Um, you have to think about quite what you're doing, but um, you can do it in blueprints. You can make multiplayer games entirely in blueprints, which is kind of crazy, kind of cool. Um, and we just recently added. Um, I think there's five or six videos just went up like yesterday. Um, Billy Bramer, one of our um, gameplay programmers on Fortnite, made these videos of how to, it's sort of an introduction to replication and networking generally, and he actually focuses on blueprint replication. So how to set up a game and uh, add variables and have those replicated between clients all done in blueprints, but it's still very applicable to C++. I mean, the, the concepts and the workflow is basically the same. Um, but we've been surprised that um, how much uh, when you start wanting to make really you know, real things in a multiplayer game using blueprints, you kind of need to know how to replicate things. If you want the fire hydrant that when you shoot it, it starts spraying water, you want that to work in the net play case. So you're going to need a little bit of logic in there to make sure that it works correctly on the clients. So yeah, we wanted to make sure we had the resources to educate people on how to do that. Cool. So yeah, yeah thanks. have a go. Hi. Um, I was wondering if your mesh import process is around the same. Um, when you export FBX, do you have to go find those files? Because I know CryEngine exports a whole bunch with dummy factors, like all at the same time into a file. Uh, are you going to release 3ds Max plugins? We don't have any plan to do 3D Studio plugins. Um, right now, each object has to be its own FBX file. Um, you can't take like multiple objects and import them all at once uh, in one FBX file. Though that's something we've talked about. That's not like on our roadmap anywhere. But I'll make a note that, given that you've asked about it. Okay. Too. Right. Uh, it's just about the speed. Um, yeah. Because I find CryEngine faster most of the time, uh, just to get things into the engine. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you can import multiple files at once, but obviously then yeah. you've got to export multiple files, which takes more time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, that's a that's a that's a good point. Um, I mean, yeah, the workflow is, 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 def is still similar to, to UE3, where you export each object as an FBX, and then you import it in. Um, but we're trying to make it more robust. Now we're starting to see um, people using tools like Blender that we hadn't really got much experience with. And so we've been really looking on the forums, looking on Arzahub to try and see people who are having problems. 4.1 uh, handles some cases we didn't handle before. It also is a bit more um, helpful when there's a problem with the file to try and help you fix any problems with it. Um, and we're hoping to get some of our um, artists to like show how to set things up in Max to come in really well. Um, so we're sort of trying to hit it from a few different fronts. You know, that uh, uh, FBX is a, is a tricky format. There's a lot of things it can hold and lots of different ways to set things up. Um, right. And we're trying to find the best way to sort of make it as friendly as possible when people are trying to get content in. All right, thank you. So. Cool. Oh, we got some landscape. <laughs> Cool, we have five minutes left. Is there anything that anyone wants to see or ask? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. In terms of um, construction scripts, yeah. um, to, to what extent can you kind of parametrically build stuff? Like, for example, if you um, try to build a, um, a building and you had, you know, kind of mesh face on the side, and like, um, like the shape of the fence, then kind of made an array to extend it up so you could adjust its floors. Could you, like, then, for example, have kind of floor surfs in it that extend based on the size of the building or um, yeah, I think so. could you populate it? It seems, I mean, there's not really any limit to what madness you could do there. Um, it'd be interesting to see. I haven't seen anyone build building. No, some people in the forums are building buildings. Yeah. Um, well, and the other thing to remember is you can do blueprints inside of blueprints. So you could have a random door generator that sits inside a mm -hmm. random wall generator that sits inside a random room generator that sits inside a random building generator. You know, like you can nest these things in, in, in crazy ways. There would definitely be uh, no bugs. <laughs> 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 and I'm sure that every combination would work together perfectly. But point being, depending on how much time you wanted to invest into it, you could definitely yeah. do it. I mean, it will work with things like static lighting. That should work fine, where um, because, do we, we talk about this session? Was that previous session? Yeah, it was previous. OK. Um, Sorry. Uh, the construction script only runs in the editor. It doesn't run if you place an object. If, a, if you've placed it, it will rerun when you load the level in the editor, because the blueprint might have changed since the last time you saved the map. Yeah. But when you open it in a cooked build, it doesn't rerun the construction script, because it assumes that the script has not changed since the, you cooked the map. 
And that makes loading times much faster, obviously, because you're not having to do all this work when you load. There's no need to. Yeah. Um, so don't do things in construction script you expect to happen um, uh, for, your, for your blueprint to function. That's one thing people sometimes find is bugs where um, they do something in the construction script, like initialize some variables or something. Um, don't do that there. Do that in begin play, the event. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, if you want to make a procedural game, construction script's not the place to necessarily do it, because again, that doesn't run in the cooked build. You want to use begin play to place your you know, random dungeon or whatever. Um, but yes, uh, pre-computed lighting should work fine on, on statically placed things. We just fixed the bug where you couldn't vertex paint on static meshes inside blueprints. We just fixed that like a week ago. So I don't know if that made 4.1 or not. Um, but it's coming really soon. Um, so yeah. It's cool, thanks. I was uh, wondering, I'm on here again. Sorry. Uh, I was wondering how uh, Unreal 4 handles inventories and, in, and inventory management and such. There's nothing built in for that. It's very much like you make your own. Um, okay. There's a lot of ways you could do it. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think every game we've made has done it in a different way. Um, but I mean, the, one of the easiest ways to do it is just like add an array to your character of classes of things that they hold. Um, and that way, you're not really using any memory for instances. And when they drop something, you just spawn an instance of that class and drop it in the world. So that's probably the easiest place to start, is um, just using the class of the object as the, uh, in your inventory. But um, things could get complicated when you start wanting to like, oh, I, I want a durability on all my objects, and I need to store that somewhere. And um, yeah, it, it's tricky, but it's tricky because game development is tricky, you know, not because you know, the engine is giving you lots of ways you could probably solve that problem. Um, and let's face it, there's been lots of RPGs made with, with UE. So, um, there's a lot of ways to cut that. I'm not really sure what the best one would be, but nothing out of the box. Cool. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been uh, it's been good. <laughs>